Hello and welcome to video three of four videos for section 1.2. In this video, we're going to be looking at composite functions. So as the name sort of implies, composite, composition, we're talking about functions that are composed of other functions. So we have the following definition given two functions, f of x and g of x. This notation here, fg with a little circle in between of x. So the way we say this is f of g of x. And what this means is the following. So we take the g function and plug it into f, whatever that function might be. So for example, if f of x is equal to x squared and g of x is equal to x minus 3, if we want to find f of x, I'm sorry, f of g, and we want to find g of f. So again, it's not, these letters are arbitrary. You can uh, generate the functions in whichever manner you want. So f of g, this means what? This is f of g of x. So we're taking g, plugging it into f. So this just means f of well, what was g? g is x minus 3. So when we have this notation, if all I said at the very start was, what's f of x minus 3? Well, what would you do? You would take x minus 3 and plug it into the x function anywhere you had an x. So it's still the same. We're just taking x minus 3. Our f function is x squared. So plug x minus 3 in anywhere we have an x. So we get x minus 3 squared. That's it. So again, we have this idea of the essence of math is to make complicated things simple, not simple things complicated. This is the perfect scenario. Don't make this more difficult than it is. Just take one function, put it into the other. So if we have g of f, this is g of f of x. So this is g of, what is f of x? f of x is x squared. So now take x squared and plug it into g anywhere I have an x. So that's simply x squared minus 3. All right. So that's sort of a straightforward example. Let's look at another one. So for example, let f of x equal the square root of x and g of x is equal to the square root of 2 minus x. This looks like our addition subtraction 1 from video 2, same functions, but now we want to find the following. So find each function. and its domain. So the first one is f of g. Second one, g of f. Third one, f of f. And the fourth one, as you can probably guess, g of g. So I'll work the first one with you. And then if you kind of feel a little bit confident about it, go ahead and pause, try to work the others. So first we want f of g, which is the same as f of g of x. So I want really f of, well, what's g of x? g of x is the square root of 2 minus x. So that means I'm plugging this into the f function anywhere I have an x. So that gives me what? Square root of this guy. 
square root of 2 minus x. So we need to simplify this. Remember, I think the very first video, one of the very first things I told you from section 1.1 is you need to know your radical math. Here's a perfect example. If I want to simplify this, how do I get rid of these double radicals? Well, what? This is like the square root of x, and this is square root of that whole thing. So when we have multiple roots, we can just multiply the values for the roots, and that gives us a simplified version. So 2 times 2 is 4. So this is really the fourth root of 2 minus x. That's our composite function f of g. Now, we want the domain for this. So, with the algebraic combinations, where we were worried about the intersections. For the composite, we're looking at what is the composite function, then go ahead and figure out the domain for that. Because we're generating a whole new function, and that's all that we're really concerned with, its domain. So, I have the fourth root of 2 minus x. Fourth root, that's even. So I still have the same issue where I want what's underneath to be greater than or equal to 0. So I want 2 minus x to be greater than or equal to 0, which as we had before, this means 2 is greater than or equal to x, or x is less than or equal to 2. So if I'm putting this in interval notation, if x is less than or equal to positive 2, that means I'm going from negative infinity up to 2, and I can cl and include it. So that gives me that. And you can kind of go back and check real quick. So pick a value that's in this interval and then ask, does it make sense? Is it okay to have this? So let's say, well, what's between negative infinity and 2? Let's go with the easy one, 0, right? So if I plug in 0, 2 minus 0 is 2. Can I have a fourth root of 2? Sure. So I can be pretty safe that that interval is the correct answer. Well, uh, I shouldn't say correct answer, but at least it seems logical that those are my values. And if you want, pick the endpoint. Pick 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. Can I have the fourth root of 0? Yes. So I'm okay with that value as well. So I can be fairly confident that I have my right interval there. All right, um, you know, let's do number two together because the function gets a little tricky, so I want to be sure to show you how to figure that out, and then maybe you can try like three and four by yourself. So two, we want g of f. So this means what? This means g of f of x. Well, g is the square root uh, sorry, so this is g of the square root of x. That's our value for f. So now I'm plugging in square root of x into g anywhere that I have an x. So that means this is the square root of 2 minus the square root of x. So that's my composite function. You have to be careful, though, here, because I can't now just change this whole thing to the fourth root like I did before, right? Because I have this plus or minus sign in here. So this is the square root of this whole thing. Now, for my domain, I have to work from the inside out on this guy to figure the domain. First thing I have to worry about is this, right? I have a square root of x in there. So that means, in this case, so let's call, let me do this in red so we can kind of keep it distinguished. First off, when I'm trying to find the domain, I'm going to worry about this piece, number one which is the square root of x. So for number one, my restriction is what? x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Right? I can't have a negative value, because if I have negative three, well, that's a problem. So I'm trying to take square root of negative three. So then number two is the whole piece here, right? Square root of this guy. So number two says that 2 minus the square root of x has to also be greater than or equal to 0. So no matter what value I pick for x, if it makes this whole thing a negative value, I've got troubles. So that means 2 minus the square root of x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if I add square root of x to both sides, that gives me 2 is greater than or equal to the square root of x. So to get x by itself, I square both sides. So that's okay, right, because 
once I square, it's not changing the inequality. If I have, for example, uh, 4 is greater than or equal to 1, so let's say we already know what that value is. If I square both sides, that means what? 16 is, le is greater than or equal to 1 still, because I'm squaring it, which is true. So it's okay with inequalities to square both sides if I need to. And if in doubt, just do that. Create an own example for yourself. Okay, this is true. What happens if I uh, change these values now? So when I do that, if I square both sides, I get what? I get 4 is greater than or equal to x, which is the same thing as saying x is less than or equal to 4. So now I have two values here. x is greater than or equal to 0. x is less than or equal to 4. So again, if I do it on a number line, for number 1, x is less than or equal, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to 0. So that gives me that. For number 2, I have x is less than or equal to 4. So if I look at the overlap, I have what? 0 to 4. Because 0 is included in both and 4 is included in both, it gets what? It gets brackets. And again, ch check the values if you want. So if I'm saying everything has to be between 0 and 4, well, what if I have negative 3? Well, that's a problem. I can't have negative 3 because of this guy. So what if I go on the other side of 4? Let's say I have uh, 16 to make the math easy. So if x is 16, well, square root of 16, that's 4. That's fine. But 2 minus 4 is negative 2, and now I have a problem. So that's why we get that 0 to 4 with the brackets. So go ahead. Uh, try 3. Try 4. Same ideas as what we just did here. If you get stuck, just hit play again. I'll be here working them out for you. Uh, then you can always hit pause if you can get past your stuck point. Uh, so try that. Try three. Try four. And uh, come on back and we'll see how you did. All right. So hopefully you were able to get those guys. Uh, so let's see number three, f of f. And I probably should have told you this, I guess, before I told you to hit pause. But f of f, it just means what? It means f of f of x. So we're just plugging the f function back into itself. So for example, f of square root of x. So maybe go ahead and try that now if you got stuck right from the get-go. Like I said, I probably should have given you that hint to start. But if we have that, if you got through this, great. It means what? It means we plug in square root of x into f. So that's what? That is the square root of the square root of x, which just like in problem number one, we can simplify this to the fourth root of x. So that's our composite function, f of f. Our domain, well, because this is even, we still have the same deal. x has to be greater than or equal to 0, which if we write this in interval form, Anything 0 to infinity is fine for the composite function f of f. For number 4, g of g. So this is g of g of x, which is g of square root 2 minus x. So if we plug that into g, it gives us what? It's the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 minus x. Pretty messy, right? So for my domain, just like with problem number 2, I'm going to need to do this in two pieces. The first one is what? I'm worried that this guy, we'll call it number 1, has to be positive because it's square root. So we've already seen over and over again that for 1, this gives us x has to be what? Less than or equal to 2. I'm not going to go through the algebra, hopefully you did, or hopefully you can, but we've seen the same value probably two, three times already, so we're always going to get the same thing. X is less than or equal to 2. Then we also have what? This whole piece, the whole thing underneath it, there are two. 
So 2 minus the square root of 2 minus x has to be greater than or equal to 0. It has to be positive because it's the square root of that guy. So again, add this square root piece to both sides. So we get 2 is greater than or equal to square root of 2 minus x. If I now square both sides, I get what? 4 is greater than or equal to, now it just gets rid of the radical sign, so 2 minus x. So if I add x to both sides, I get x plus 4 is greater than or equal to 2 and get rid of the 4, so subtract 4 from both sides tells me that this thing says x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So now, just as before, draw your number line. Make it easy on yourself. So for number 1, x is less than or equal to 2. And 2 can be included, that's fine. For the second part, x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So again, close circle. It's okay if it's included. So then the question is, where's my overlap? Well, it's negative 2 up to positive 2. And because it's okay if I include the endpoints, it gets the brackets. That's our composite function. I'm going to be using these a lot. If you're not comfortable, go back and try some of the examples from the book. Try the odd ones. It's got the answers in the back, or it should have the answers in the back for you. Try your web assigned homework if you have that. Try these until you get comfortable with it, because again, you're going to be using composite functions a lot throughout the semester. That's it for video three. Come on back. We'll do video four real quick, and that'll wrap up section 1.2.